I started out in editing. I was an editor. For, I've been an editor for much of my career um, in narrative film and documentary film. And I've recently segued in the last five years into directing and producing. And um, and I'm, I'm directing a number of documentary films. That's sort of my passion, social justice issue documentary films. And that segue, it's interesting. It's taken me, it is definitely, definitely a... Um, uh, sort of a lateral move and I've, I've really enjoyed it I kind of reached a point in my career I think at 40 where I felt like I was stagnating a little bit and I wanted to branch out um, I had been editing for a long time and it seemed like a natural move was directing I was also becoming older like the older editor and um, working with a lot of younger people and I did feel that I was more seasoned than a lot of the directors I was working with, which, which made me impatient, you know, and I felt like I needed to, in order to sort of um, expand a bit, and also maybe get, you know, learn more and, and also gain some empathy <laughs> for the people I was working with. Because the, as the editor, you're always end of the line, you know, and you're the, the horrible naysayer sometimes who, even though you're an incredibly creative force on the team, you're also the naysayer who looks back and complains about everything they did wrong. You know, well, you didn't get this shot. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. You didn't, you know, and I feel like being in the field has really helped me understand and kind of empathize with how challenging that part of the job is. I did feel that I'd wanted to try my hand at, at uh, being the sort of lead creative on the team, which a director is. Now, I will say filmmaking is incredibly collaborative. And um, in my experience, the directors that I've worked with, the best directors understand the role of all the key players and they really value them and they look to their input to make a great product at the end and they understand that realizing their vision requires that. So I think I've had incredibly great experiences, you know, being in a collaborative position with a director and a producer and, you know, a cinematographer. But for me, it was, it was the idea of wanting to tell stories the way that in some ways, you know, to express my own creative vision. But it was also that there were stories that I really felt were not being told that I wanted to make sure got out there. And a lot of them have to do with people of color and women, um, and oftentimes women of color, the two intersect. So that was important to me. I think that we, our voices are often not heard as women of color in media and television and film. And there is a change, there's sort of a movement growing around it, which is really powerful, led by filmmakers like Ava DuVernay. And you know, then there's also Black Lives Matter. And there's, there's so many, and this sort of um, Oscar So White campaign, there's been a lot of social movement around it but uh, there's always more work to do. So I felt I wanted to be part of that. In my editing career, I think some of the films that I am the most proud of, um, there's, is I worked on Spike Lee's four-part series, When the Levees Broke, and it was about, um, about Hurricane Katrina and its effect on New Orleans. And that was definitely, um, one of the most important films I think I've ever worked on, or series, I should say. And it, um, it really, I think Spike is an incredible visionary, Spike Lee, and I owe him so much because he actually was the person who brought me into this, into this uh, field. He was, he gave me an internship when I was 21 and on his film Malcolm X. And so that, from there, you know, I just kind of was able to move forward. Um, so that film was really powerful and meaningful and sort of opened my eyes to what social justice films can do. And then there's another film I worked on called Budros, which is available on Netflix, <laughs> which is ways if anybody wants to say it. But it's this, it was an incredible film about the, a nonviolent resistance movement in the, um, in the West Bank. So the occupied territories. And it was essentially in the media here, you never hear anything about that sort of occurrence happening, particularly in, you know, within the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And this story of this nonviolent protest um, that was ongoing, essentially there was a security wall as, that the Israelis erected 
to uh, to keep, you know they basically built it all around Israel to protect themselves from the threat of Palestinian terrorists. However, the wall encroached and actually took much of the land that Palestinians owned, and there was this this nonviolent movement that went on there got the government to move the border of the wall and we never heard about it here and there's all this always this question that was brought up like where is the palestinian martin luther king where is the palestinian gandhi and it's actually happening but i think the slant of the media chooses oftentimes to demonize and vilify certain groups of people to follow the you know essentially in line to keep the media in line with the agenda of um of the u.s sort of those U.S. foreign policies in the Middle East and, and again, between, with Israel and Palestine. So, so that was a really amazing experience. It was a film that had a lot of activist footage in it, and it sort of changed my view on things. And then, as far as directing, the best stuff, I think, or my favorite thing recently is a film that I directed that came out called A Journey of a Thousand Miles Peacekeepers, and it's a film about an all-female, all-Muslim unit of women who are sent from Bangladesh, they are police officers sent from Bangladesh out on to Haiti on mission for one year as UN peacekeepers. And this film, I had never heard about women from my diaspora doing this kind of work. And that was really, I mean, I really wanted to tell this story because again, the, the portrayal of women and particularly women from my part of the world, from the South Asian diaspora and the media is often that of victims. And when it comes to Muslim women, it is either that they are absent or it is that of victims. Again, I think in line with um, U.S. policies in, um, in predominantly Muslim countries, it is, it's sort of a way to justify what the U.S. might be doing over there and the wars that we wage. And I felt like it was really important for people to see a story about some kick-ass Muslim women <laughs> that would make them accessible to us, but also uh, to just to, to, to humanize them and to sort of change that narrative that the, media, um, that the media has sort of supported for the last, honestly, probably 20 years, if not longer. So um, that's the film that's out now that I feel like will hopefully make some impact. So the first, the first Emmy I won was for When the Levees Broke, and that was, my, that was my first Emmy, and that was incredibly exciting <laughs> for us because I had never been before, and, um, and it was, for me at that time, an incredibly glamorous event, and it still is a very glamorous event. Um, but I didn't, you know, to be recognized in that way by a community, particularly as um, social justice filmmakers, I think we often feel that Hollywood pays very little mind to what we are doing or the work we are doing and to be acknowledged in that way and I think particularly for you know as again um, you know it was a film predominantly about the African-American community down there in New Orleans that suffered the most and has been the most sort of marginalized and maligned and neglected and abused and it was a really powerful thing to to have the you know sort of the dominant community uh, recognize that. So that was great. And the second Emmy I won was for editing a film called By the People, The Election of Barack Obama. And that, I have to say, was, it was, it was one of also, I, I mean, I, it's hard to say a favorite film because I have so many favorite films, but that film also, we followed um, Obama's, his first campaign to become president. And, um, and so to win for that, right after he had won the election, was you know, it was so meaningful. I mean, the first black president, and we were all in love with him, <laughs> I can't lie. We all, you know, we were all so goofy about him, you know, and he was, and then to, you know, we, to sort of have that intimate access to what he had to go through, he and his campaign, and then later to get and have Hollywood recognize that was, uh, was powerful. Again, a story about a man, a black man, who ascended to presidency, you know, those were, it was very, uh, it was very gratifying. So I think um, in the last two years in particular, a lot of attention has been drawn to the fact that um, there's been these multiple campaigns uh, about integrating more women into Hollywood, into 
powerful positions. And then also the Oscars So White campaign, which, uh, which really changed the trajectory of the Oscars last year and created you know, some controversy, but also really a lot of strong conversations and powerful conversations and necessary conversations about this issue. I think um, obviously we live in a white dominant, white supremacist culture still. And I think that in hand in hand with the Black Lives Matter movement, movement Hollywood has had to step up and take notice. You know, they've had to at least pay attention to their diversity. Um, and, and, and there's, interestingly, there is a diversity initiative that's been implemented just this year in which they've been trying to recruit more, um, more people of color and more women to the academy because historically it's been very white and very male. And these are sort of the people who are involved in the academy and can vote, you know, for the films that you know, that are to win the awards. So I'm, I, I feel like, I mean, historically Hollywood, like all of our industries, was, is a white male dominated industry with white men in positions of power making the decisions about the films that get made, the films that get financing, and the people who play the roles that in, in our films. Um, again, there's tremendous pressure now, and I'm, I'm inspired by that. I'm really, I actually... I'm really excited by the rise of, I mean, spike of certain filmmakers too in recent years, like Ryan Coogler and Ava DuVernay. And I think, you know, Spike Lee, I was kind of blessed to work with him. And he, uh, you know, again, starting with Malcolm X, and I feel like he was one of the pioneers of his time. There were, of course, others that came before him, but he was incredibly outspoken and remains outspoken, as we know, about these issues of sort of race and um, he's not as good on gender, but I would say he's good on race. And he um, and and he's really sort of brought that conversation to the forefront. I think now with it is really upon us, and I feel this way about me as well, as people of color. If we get a foot in the door, it is our job to push it open, you know, and to turn around and hold out our hand mm -hmm. to everyone coming behind us. You know, I will say that. One thing I'm very impressed by, for example, is Ava DuVernay on her last film, which just came out the 13th, her entire crew was African-American or of color. Like she basically, you have to, we have to make concerted efforts to, to bring people into the fold, you know? And I think that this is something I hate to say, and, we, and, and if it doesn't happen, we have to, we actually have to talk about it. I think that we still work in a world where you know, there will be a film, perhaps films may be being made about us, but when you look around at who's, who's working on them and who's making the decisions about them, it's, it's not us. So I think there's, you know, it's an ongoing job to keep that narrative in our own hands, to make sure our stories are being told by us, for us, and with us, uh, being in, with us in positions that matter. Um, so I think, I've, I've fa I feel like I've faced some of that, I do think. In some ways it is easier for women. I think that women are seen as less threatening mm -hmm. in, the, in the workplace, as that is true. And that is true across the board than men of color. Mm -hmm. well, I think black and brown men are seen as more threatening in some ways, and it is harder for them to get um, certain jobs. Although, interestingly, in Hollywood and in filmmaking, the c directors have predominantly been male. So that is one place where I think for black men, you know, black and brown men, it's been easier to ease into those positions because there is a tremendous amount of sexism around the role of a director um, and that it's historically male. But in general, I feel like it's women have can fit into all the other roles easier, you know. Uh, the only other one maybe not cinematography. Cinematography too, male, predominantly male. But I think we have to kind of nurture the, you know the people who come behind us and and make sure to refer them and to not even to refer but and then to demand the productions that we work on have a certain diversity you know there has to there has to be a, a diversity initiative in sort of in everywhere we go we have to either demand it or um, or essentially be the or start it you know that's what the, I think that's what I would say about it. And uh, I, as as with my own as far as my own trajectory, I do feel like documentary film is easier for women to get into, but partly because the amount of money 
as far as directing and producing, it's easier for women to get into. But partly because the money is less. You know, the notorious joke that was made at the Oscars last year by Louis C.K. was that whoever wins the Academy Award for best documentary or best short documentary will be driving home in a Honda Civic. So I think it is much easier for people. People feel much more comfortable handing women a job when there's less at stake financially. But, and that is not true with narrative film. So that's also something that we have to still work on changing.